people. You know, just hanging out, searching the world for a worthy challenger. They're too intimidated by you. Nobody wants to play. That's they know what I'm happening. telling you. They, they see your name and that's it. They, they know how this game is going to end. <laughs> In a victory for them, I think. <laughs> I don't know uh, about while that. we're... Oh, I just got a match. I see. Oh, against Fosa one from Russia. All right. He's from Russia, so that scares me. Um, because stereotypically, I yes. feel like they're good at chess. Very good at chess, of course. Russian players, uh -huh. pretty good. Okay. Per okay, indeed. So D five, very good. Standard opening moves. And D four is a very rare guest at at your your rating the vast majority of people play e4 their king spawn forward are, are you familiar with chess notation by the way i don't know how much to to rely on it uh by that do you mean like just like uh what you said like e4 and all that kind of stuff like the file and the yeah 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 like like when i name moves like bishop here bishop f5 or oh that's f6. fine that's fine oh perfect, yeah, I, perfect. sometimes i'll have to like look like embarrassingly but yeah that's fine right no that's totally fine okay so he's you know Sometimes in the opening, the actual moves that you make aren't that critical as long as you're doing stuff with the knight or bringing your pieces out. Yeah, yeah, development. If, if that makes right? sense. So he's kind of screwing around a little bit with his queen. And yeah. you can use this opportunity to simply continue your development. He's trying to intimidate you. Yeah, it doesn't seem like the most credible threat. Uh, uh, and maybe that's my famous last words here. <laughs> um, no, actually... It doesn't, like, I'm not really scared. I don't know what that's supposed to tell me. You shouldn't be. What was the rationale behind your last move? Okay, so bishop g5. This is a red alert moment right now. And okay. you need to get into okay. the early habit of, especially early on in your chess development, asking yourself what the threat is. So what is he threatening with his last move? Uh, the move he just made with the bishop. So yep. he's, he's, he's threatening my queen. Um, so he can take the queen uh, either if I take him or if I do nothing. So Exactly. I think my initial reaction is i need to put a piece in the path of the queen exactly. i don't i should not be moving the queen that's exactly um, right because you want to simultaneously be developing your pieces so there's many ways of doing that several good moves what comes to mind and you can make a couple of... things mm -hmm. this this one came to mind initially perfect that's a great move simultaneously defending against the threat and developing your piece which mm -hmm. is the ideal way of defending against any type of threat he's probably going to take your bishop and then you got to already start thinking in advance about what you want to take that bishop with, which maybe your kind of intuition is already suggesting. Okay, so that's good. He just moved it Whoa. back, so he wasted an entire like move, right? And helps you develop, absolutely. Um, so that's pretty good for me. Um, now I have to figure out what I'm going to do here. So I can't. I think I'll I'll do that. That's a great move. Keep on developing. Um, mm -hmm. Tuck your king away. So. He's again. He's moved his queen out. He's lost the tempo. Tempo just means basically move. Um, in chess, he's lost a move with his bishop, right. and uh, you have a lead in development here. So you've got a great position out of the open. Whoa. Okay. Okay. Very aggressive um, Russian. <laughs> very aggressive. I, I don't. That doesn't really. Yeah, that doesn't track for me. Like, okay, I guess he's threatening the pawn, but like I can trade, and if I take the his pawn, mm -hmm. um with my um knight uh am i stupid i feel like that's free it is i i'm gonna do it i always second guess myself because i've been in so many situations <laughs> where i've been like oh this is the play and then it all becomes obvious after the fact right check me <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah exactly oh, that's a free pot exactly right there. oh no and then yeah, as soon as you release the pc you see it but here in reality it is free um and there is this balance between second guessing yourself on the one hand and being confident on the other. It's a natural progression. You're just going to get more confident as you get your feet under you. Um, and as you come to know more strategies, you'll see that oftentimes your opponent doesn't want to do anything at all. Yeah. Uh, he kind of, yeah, I'm not really sure what that's supposed to accomplish that, that pawn to age four. I'm going to be honest with you, Colin, me neither. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of say, yep. Excellent. Now, with full due respect to most of your opponents, I would say probably 50 to 75% of their moves have no intention behind them at all. So you can kind of safely proceed. The key for you right now 
is the identification of threats. As long as you can identify what your opponent is threatening, if he's threatening something, and not blunder pieces, that is sort of going to be the first serious step forward that you make. That in combination with applying basic strategies of opening and middle game, that's going to bring you to like okay. seven, eight hundred, which is, you know, already. It might seem to be in the in the stratosphere right now, but I can already I see know that, that you're underrated. <laughs> I know that that's not very high, but uh, yeah, I uh, it's much higher than I am now. So I'm 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 ready. I'm ready to get there. I'm eager to get there. <laughs> yeah, when I was okay, ninety five. So. Okay, so talk about identifying threats. Mm -hmm. he's, he's threatening the knight, my knight, at uh, at c6, but there's lots of trade potentials there, so it kind of comes out even. Before this move was made, I was already thinking about putting my queen at d6. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that changes this. Uh, well, you mentioned taking the knight, right? What, can yeah. you try to forecast what happens there? If you take his knight with one mm. of your knights what does what does he do uh he trades with his pawn that's currently at d4 and then we have these pawns staring at each other at at e5 and e6 kind of right locked. but if you count uh, the number of attackers that are currently accessing that e5 square do you see that both of your knights are actually contesting that square now i do <laughs> and only now one I pawn do. of his is defending that square which means by definition he's essentially blundered something on that square Right, so I can come out um, a pawn ahead in this bingo, this trade bingo, which is not the end of the world for him. But notice that while you've been developing your pieces, he's been pushing his pawns around. So not only do you mm -hmm. have two extra pawns now, but you have a tremendous lead in development, which you could then use um, to transform it into either an attack or pressure against his position. A lead in development is a huge asset that as you get more experience you're going to come to appreciate and kind of know how to exploit mm -hmm. yeah i think that's one of my really serious issues is i'll get leads like this often mm -hmm. right where i'm up a piece or two or whatever and then after that i'm kind of like oh shit like what do i how do i take advantage exactly. of this other than just you know playing move to move totally get it that's actually one of the that is like what i will put the emphasis on initially and this is a great time to start probing that you have this lead in development what to do now mm -hmm. what comes mm -hmm. to your mind well he just retreated retreated his queen which is, is kind of interesting mm -hmm. uh trying to control this d line uh but i mean i'm not i'm not too worried about that right now i i want to develop like i want to bring out this bishop at c uh mm -hmm. c8 uh or or the queen um so i'm kind of thinking this good move Good move, activating the queen. And, you know, after the game, I'll share with you sort of the finer points. I'm, I'm taking down some notes as to your thinking process. But okay. by and large, you're doing everything good so far. Yeah, he's he's his board state is really underdeveloped. It's not really looking that great for mm -hmm. him. Just I just I'm sure I will blunder very soon. I'm sure I will even <laughs> even up the score. It's all good. So he's developed his knight. Uh, nothing immediately threatening. So I kind of want to bring this bishop out if I can. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to do this personally. Okay. So you want to pave open that d7 square for the bishop? Is that your idea? Yeah, that's right. That's a nice idea. That's called fianchettoing the bishop. There's actually a term for that. Putting the okay, bishop so on I've that heard, particular square. I've heard this term and uh, I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> yeah and notice that your bishop is now positioned on what's called the long diagonal there are two long diagonals the ones that crisscross the entire board and obviously you measure how good a piece is among other things by the amount of squares that it controls the bishop controls a lot of squares as we'll mm -hmm. see but red alert what does he want to do red alert okay now he's he's i was already thinking about how i can clear the path for my bishop to take his rook but now i've got a bigger problem in front of me Bingo. i have my knight is being threatened by the pawn i gotta get this guy out of here exactly gotta get and... this guy out of here now where do you put it there's many good yeah. squares yeah c4 is interesting because it's like baiting out a trade i don't really know if that gets me anywhere in the long run mm -hmm. so i'm inclined to be more conservative and like maybe go g4 good uh i 
think I'll do that. That's a great square. Um, there is an advanced chess concept um, that we're not going to touch on too much today. That's called an outpost, but I can kind of introduce okay. it to you. And an outpost is it's a relatively self self explanatory concept. It's when a piece is like past the fifth rank, past the hemisphere, and it's supported by a pawn as the knight is. And the key element of an outpost is that it cannot be dislodged by one of your opponent's pawns because both of them have moved past the square where they can attack the knight. But another red alert, he's made a somewhat inadvisable little move there. Okay. So what has he done here? Move that pawn up, I guess, to support his other pawn. Mm -hmm. I don't really know why. I mean, I, I guess I was threatening with the queen. Right. See, the thing that I can't get out of my head is I want to move my pawn that's on d5 up and like, okay, it'll get taken, like whatever. But then I can threaten his his rook. That's a fantastic um, move. That is so a fantastic move. I want to do that. And obviously he'll see that. So he won't even take the pawn. I think he, just he might. Get the rook out. If I know the mentality of these players, he might actually think, oh, this Colin guy, who's this Colin McNeil? He's blundering pawns left and right. Maybe he'll see it. I mean, you... you You've played opponents like these, but I think he just might take that pawn. I, I'm going to bet he sees it. I will bet you he sees it. He might. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, my God. You were right. I've been around I the don't block. Even under, <laughs> I don't even understand. <laughs> Amazing move. And I, the thing is, d4 is the best move in the position. If he would have moved his rook, he would have taken his pawn. And we, we, you know, we'll discuss that afterward. Okay, so he takes that pawn. Um consolation prize for him yeah Who cares? But a small one very small he's not threatening anything i can uh i actually kind of want to move this this rook that's currently at a8 to b um i can threaten his bishop and also the rook can do something he's just kind of like tucked away over there not okay doing anything. are there anything so that uh-huh sorry yeah is there anything no no, no that was, I was saying that's my initial thought. and that's that's something you need to get into the habit of asking yourself is there anything okay. hanging whether it's pieces or pawns that you could just capture anything that's free there is the pawn at e3 that is definitely free for my knight. Snatch it up. I don't know if you've had your lunch yet, but there's no such thing as too much material on the chessboard. <laughs> Very true. Okay, okay, let's do that. Let's Thanks, do Cappy, that. for the subs. Appreciate it, man. Yep. And notice that what is the knight doing there other than, you know, chilling? He's uh, threatening the queen, Bingo. which is pretty serious business. Now, look oh, at... This guy's going to have to deal with it. Yeah, he's going to have to deal with that. And also look at... Well, he, he did deal with it um now he's attacking your knight and the best types of chess moves are the ones where you capture something that's free and defend something that's being attacked at the same time right is there a way Lo to affect that there i think his his pawn at d4 if i mm -hmm. take it with my queen i defend the knight yeah i think that Bingo. works it does very nice move. try that Look at his king. His king is wide open. And most of the games at your level, most of the games you play up until your 1300, which is a thousand points from now, are going to be decided by a direct attack on the king. Well, that's not entirely accurate. They're going to be decided in one of two ways, either by a blunder or by a direct attack on the king. But you're low on time. I don't want to distract you. He's given you a check. Okay. Let's do that very nice defending the bishop and defending against the check simultaneously good move okay he's out of there he's he's had enough he has um threatening no not really uh okay what should i do here when in doubt check for free stuff there check. is a free pawn and a check that Very goes good. with it. Check that lottery ticket. Now he's going to move his king up to e2. Start thinking about what threats he creates when he brings his king up. Mm hmm. Is he threatening any of your pieces? The the well, he's not really threatening the knight because I have the knight covered. He can't he can't take it. Actually, right? he is because he's attacking it with two of his pieces, the king and the queen, and you're only defending it with one. It's one against two. Right. The king does participate right. as an attacker here. So you have to right. evacuate that. Uh... Or, or could I do this? Good idea, but not 
concretely. Oh, you gave them? there's your blunder. There's your blunder <laughs> that I guaranteed you. But okay. <laughs> now I'm satisfied. No, so I was oh about to say, God. where is that blunder I was promised, Colin? Oh, it's um, right there. Now oh I don't have to God. leave the call anymore. But not to panic. Is he attacking any of your pieces other than the knight? Uh, he's attacking the rook, but I mean, it's it's. It's yeah, not I gotta covered. Get there. You gotta well the rook is pinned. You cannot move the rook. Yeah, yeah. He's you pinned. have only one possible move in this position. You have to simultaneously defend the knight while intercepting his queen's attack of your rook. There is one move that serves both purposes. And there's only one move that does that. He's attacking your rook with his queen. And we'll unpack this after the game. For now, try to consult your instincts here. Oh boy, that's a bad move for me usually. <laughs> oh man. Uh... You have to move that knight somewhere. There is a particular square where you intercept the queen's coverage of your rook. Yep, very nice. Very, very nice. And even though he can take a second rook, his king is still very, very exposed. So in reality, your position is not that bad, believe it or not. Nice move. Okay. I'm definitely gonna flag this game. This happens to me a lot. That's totally okay. And the important thing is that you're playing a good game. You're still winning in this position. Thanks, Gosh. I don't know what to do. He is attacking your queen, and you moved it. Very, very good. Yeah, he actually defended pretty well there. That's a good move as well. But now he can take your knight. Yeah, and there I go. I lose. See, this is this is my problem. I'm up on all these pieces. I feel like I'm in a good spot. Mm -hmm. And because I take too long and or I do one blunder and I freak out and then mm -hmm. I just I flag. Totally understand. So you're probably eager to jump in for another game. But my proposal is I will invite you to... Oops. One second, sorry. I will invite no you to, I keep getting random Skype calls. I will invite you to an analysis board, um, which will pop up on your, if you're okay with that. And oh, I, I want to unpack a couple of moments there. So we'll delve right into that thing that makes you anxious, which is, well, what the heck do you do when you reach that good position? Um, now, uh, for my for my producer on, on the call here, Colton, can you see the analysis board? So I, I'll no, you'll actually- you invite me as well. If you click on it, uh, Colin, you should it should pop up on your screen. Um, and I'm inviting you right now in a moment. Okay. Okay. So you'll see the invite pop up. Should be on the lower right of your screen. Um, Colin McNeil. Just sent the invite. So. Perfect. Got that. And then Excellent. and then Colton, yes. do you need an invite to this as well? Yeah. Sorry, Daniel. We're streaming it from my no problem. My side, uh, so the stream actually sees my screen. Could you okay. could you give me your um chess.com uh, account name Colin can you uh, can you put it in the discord call and I can't minimize mine just yeah so uh, wait, what, do you, what do you need in the uh, my discord? chess username chess.com username gotcha gotcha sorry for that I mean we can find an alternate that's method okay. of it no 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 this is totally no, fine it's work. kind of like our Perfect. like weird method of streaming this <laughs> no just I'm, we're streaming it from like our my producers you like you guys uh, are professional POV. <laughs> Uh, I just I just want to do as little work as possible. That's all. <laughs> I want to focus on the chess if I can. My so guy, exactly. <laughs> all right, where do I find all my friends here so I can give them your name? What is it, Colton? Can you just spell it's Colton it? G. Colton G. E N not O N. Colton G. One word. And is, is it case sensitive? I don't think so. Okay. Capital C and G though. Colton G. That's Perfect. what I that's what I put in. Yeah. Inviting you right now. Just sent you that invite beautiful amazing now sometimes fair warning the analysis interface might glitch um, and the moves might stop transmitting from my end to your end so if that happens just let me know um, like sometimes I'll be making moves and you'll stop seeing them that's just a chess.com glitch uh, that happens once in a while hopefully it won't happen here now can you see me actually relaying the moves and, and clicking through some of the moves yep yep perfect got it awesome so um, the start of the game was actually fantastic and Stop me if at any moment I'm drawing on too long. I'll try to be succinct. Um, but a couple of things that I want to unpack. Number one, in terms of the actual mechanics of piece development, 
Um, one of the most common mistakes that, that you'll find yourself making is, and I'll introduce a concept called tunnel vision that's gonna help you conceptualize that. But preliminarily, oftentimes you think about developing one piece and by trying to develop one piece, you thereby block the development of another piece. Now, how this works is you played this movie six, right? And you're right. opening up the diagonal for this bishop. Right. But do you notice that you're also closing down the diagonal for your other bishop? Yes. So this bishop only has this lame little square on d7 to go to, which is not a terrible way of developing it, but it's not very active, right? It doesn't control as many squares as it could. So what move could you suggest here so that when you do play e6, you don't actually block this bishop on c8? uh the bishop to f5 exactly and you can actually make moves um i should okay. be able to see them i'm also keeping an eye on your stream so if the transmission stops i'll be able to catch that okay so i just made that move which hopefully you guys see um sometimes i need to like nudge it a, a, a couple of times so I, I i manually input a bishop f5 that's exactly right or bishop g4 then let's say he develops his own bishop then you play the movie six and the bishop is outside of the pawn chain, then you can very safely develop the other bishop. You see right. what I'm saying? Yes. So in general, when you're developing, you want to make sure that when you're preparing the development of one piece, you're not blocking the development of another. That's something that's going to take some practice, and you're going to make that mistake a couple times, but it's just mm -hmm. a good rule of thumb to keep in mind. Not that e6 is that bad. Um, so here you played the move f5. What was sort of the rationale behind this move if you had to sort of reconstruct it? There wasn't a lot of rationale <laughs> other than just the concept of I want to go into the middle of the board and I knew that that pawn was going to be protected by the pawn at e6. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, let me, let's just grab this territory for the sake of grabbing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's interesting. So it's not a bad move. Um, the reason that you have to be careful about pushing pawns in general is that pushing any kind of pawn by definition creates weaknesses behind it. So when you push the pawn from F7, do you notice how the king, you know, it's like the king is riding in the backseat of the car and you've pulled the windows down. You've opened up the diagonal, you've opened up some squares. And the problem is that if you ever castle short, the fact that you've pushed this pawn out might actually cost you because mm. again, you've opened up some avenues potentially toward that black king. Um, right. So does that make sense conceptually? That... The that makes a lot of sense. That's actually super helpful because I have noticed in my games, I am, as you say, pushing pawns a lot. Like I'm developing the pawns mm -hmm. all the time. And, <laughs> and just even to someone uh, who is, you know, has, has as low rating as I do, even I understand that like, okay, listen, they're not the most powerful piece. They're the weakest piece. Like you should put your more powerful pieces out there. So that's good for me to, to hear it, hear it the way you put it like that. Exactly. And, it's the way that I've come to explain this is like, it's not that pushing pawns out is inherently bad, but it's like, I'm teaching you to drive a car, but you're insisting on learning how to drive a bus before you're learning how to drive a car. Like pawns right. are very niche pieces and they're very hard to handle. So the first step is to learn piece placement. And that is why, even if you're tempted to push pawns out for the next, you know, couple of months that you're playing for the next couple of hundreds of points that you gain, I think that you should sort of consciously prioritize playing with the pieces and only push pawns when you would know exactly what role that is serving. Like you, you make a pawn move, I should be able to ask you, Colin, why did you make this move? You say, well, I wanted to control the square. I wanted to defend against the threat. I wanted to chase away this piece. Um, this move is more sort of kind of up in the air. I kind of wanted to control some squares, but it creates a lot of weaknesses behind it, if that right. makes sense. That does make sense. I've actually just opened up a little document and, and written that down. Like, Man. prioritize pushing pieces, not pawns. That is that is diligent. Um, I am probably the laziest grandmaster you'll ever meet, so I'm always impressed at people's work ethic, um, especially when beginning chess is just, there's so much to talk about, and you're, you're lost at sea, so I appreciate yes. your attitude. I think it's, it's going to take you far. So I hope so. My skill won't. <laughs> uh, it, that'll come trust it'll all come together you just have to have faith so this was all great you develop your bishop you develop your knight g4 is just a free pawn um 
Now, you could have also taken that pawn with your pawn. That would have been very much possible. And yes. do you see that you would have simultaneously created a threat here? Yes. Uh, what are you threatening? Uh, threatening his knight uh, with that pawn. Threatening his knight with that pawn. So in order to practice uh, one concept that I want to give you a little bit of practice in, which is counting defenders and attackers, let's say that he would have responded by pushing his knight out to e5. First and foremost, can, can you take this knight with your knight? Yes, I can take it with the knight at c6. For some reason, the chess.com software is glitching. It won't allow me to execute that move. I'm kidding. Actually, skip, it's uh... illegal. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just trolling you. <laughs> Why is the knight is the move knight takes c5 illegal? Is it actually illegal? It actually is illegal because of what? A concept called the pin. 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 The queen on a4. What can you tell me about it? What is it doing? What is its relationship to the black king? Oh, uh, of course I can't. I can't move my knight out of there. I I understand. He's he's pinned by the queen. He's okay. Pinned of by course the queen. I can't. And by by your use of that term, I imagine you've you've been introduced to that concept in general, right? The concept of a pin. Yeah, I've seen it in uh, in in various videos from you and and Hikaru mm -hmm. and Botez and and so on. Right, and and you can think of it more abstractly as any situation where a piece cannot move away from a square for any particular reason. It doesn't right. have to be. Most people confuse it and they think, oh, it's only a pin against the king. If the queen was sitting on e eight instead of the king, um. Well, then the knight could legally move, but in many cases, that wouldn't be very advisable. You don't want to give away your queen. Right. So one corollary to that, and it's a little bit advanced, but I think it's a good rule of thumb. Um, the lesser value a piece is, the better, the better it is at actually making a pin, which sounds like a very paradoxical statement, but let me unpack that for you for a second. Let's imagine a scenario. I'm just going to make some random moves to, to paint that picture. Let's imagine a scenario where Plax queen was on e8. You see this relationship, right? Right. Now, is the knight on c6 actually pinned? The answer to that question is no, because let's say white makes a random move and you capture the knight. Does white win a queen here with queen takes e8? Is white winning material? No, it's a straight trade. It's a straight trade. But if a lesser value piece is pinning this knight, then it's much less likely to be a straight trade. So could you orchestrate an actual valuable pin with one of your pieces against the knight on c6? If I'm white. If you're white, yeah. White to move in yeah. this position. Yeah, I, I move the bishop to b5. Bingo. That's exactly right. And now if the knight takes on e5, because the bishop is lesser value, it's a lot more painful for black. Black loses a queen for a bishop, which is huge. Yes. So does that kind of make sense? So the queen is still pinning the knight. This is a pin because there's a king behind the knight. But if there was a queen behind the knight, this wouldn't have been as effective of a pin. So... With all of that in mind, in this position, could you find, instead of the move knight f6 that you played, a move to disarm this pin and actually turn this pin back around on white? Turn it back around on yep. white. Yep, and that shows you exactly why they say don't bring your queen out early. The queen isn't good at doing the dirty work because okay. it's too valuable to be given up. So as soon as it's in danger the queen loses its potency could you put this queen in danger by creating something called an x-ray an x-ray and it's kind of actually a reverse pin it's like it's not quite a pin but it's when one of your pieces stares down an opponent's piece through the lens of another piece or through Whoa. the scope of another piece well uh I'm not 100% sure if this is where this is going, but could you you can move the bishop that's on c8 to uh, to d7? That is exactly right. And what would be the idea? Okay. What am I talking about in terms of x-ray? So the bishop mm -hmm. is staring down that queen. Like, just forget about the knight for a second. It's like almost looking over the knight. Bingo. And that is a very powerful concept because if the knight ever moves away, even if the knight mm -hmm. sacrifices itself, let's say white in all his infinite wisdom plays knight e5, and black takes the knight. The, the sort of x-ray has opened up. Can white take the knight back with his pawn? I mean, he definitely can't unless he wants to give me a free queen. <laughs> exactly. Which he, doesn't. Yeah, which he doesn't, but many people actually will. So that would be an effective defensive mechanism. Just wanted to kind of point, point that out. 
but I know you're anxious yeah. to get to sort of the technical phase. Now here, again, whenever your opponent places a piece on a square where it can be captured, you want to also get into the habit of counting defenders and attackers. And to do that, you have to look at the whole board. Because I mentioned tunnel vision earlier. I hinted at that concept. Tunnel vision is a concept I use um, to refer to situations where and this usually refers to beginners but even i can do it sometimes the action is occurring on one side of the board usually so your eyes are like literally drawn to that particular side of the board and it's very easy to forget that there exist pieces that are on the opposite side of the board that are also participating in the action so here hmm. for example i'll delineate the area of the board that you're most likely to be looking at right this because yes. this is where the knight yes. was this is where he sacked upon and you're forgetting about this night because it's outside of that zone. And you have to make a conscious effort, at least for the first couple of months, to look at the whole board, to appreciate how each and every piece is participating in the game, even if it's outside of the immediate zone of action. Um, if that makes sense. It does, and I'm also writing this down. Because I definitely tunnel vision. I mean, that's where the blunders come from, right? It's like somebody comes out of nowhere. It's not nowhere, but it mentally... For me, it's like, whoa, how did that happen? Well, it was staring you right in the face. You just were looking at this quadrant of the board for all the reasons you stated. Exactly. And that is, in fact, one of the biggest sources of blunders. And I have, if you think that GMs are immune from that, absolutely not true. I remember I was rated about 2000 and I had a game where I took a pawn with one of, with, with, with one of my bishops, right? And he has a rook somewhere. So I took this a7 pawn that I highlighted in red. And okay. the other highlight was where his rook was. And there were no pieces on the seventh rank. His other rook was on A8. And I took the pawn, I get up, I walk around, I'm, I won a pawn, I'm feeling good. Then I come back down, and on his score sheet, you know, the place where, where you have to write down the notation during over the board chess games, my opponent records the move that he's about to play. And he records the move rook G takes A7. And I'm like, rook G takes A7, does he want to give away a rook for a bishop? Like, is he, is he dumb? And then he grabs the rook that's on g7 and takes my bishop, and I literally fell out of my chair. I had completely <laughs> excommunicated that rook from my visual understanding of the position. So it happens to very strong players as well. Don't feel discouraged about it. Okay. So That's heartening. That's very heartening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> GMs are pretty bad too. Um, that's basically the lesson here. So queen d1, and now we get to the meat. Now we get to what you really need work on, which is what do you do when you reach these types of overwhelming positions. Now, what you did here is perfect. B5, Fian Kettering the bishop, putting the bishop on a very active square has a great amount of potential. So far, so good. He continues to push his pawns up. So instead of developing his pieces, he continues to introduce more and more weaknesses in his position. So is that kind of making sense so far? It, it is making sense so far, yeah. The move knight g4 is really good to finish off that concept of the outpost because... Do you see that this knight cannot be dislodged by any of his pawns? Mm -hmm. Why? Because he's pushed both of the potential pawns to the same rank that the knight is on. So these pawns can't land on h3 or f3. As the expression goes, pawns do not go backward. And this is why it's so risky to push too many of your pawns. Precisely because it right. creates all of these holes in his position. So knight g4 was perfect. Now after e3, you found an amazing move d4. But could you have also taken any free stuff here so the pawn he just pushed to e3 mm -hmm. would be free for my knight it is and you're attacking his queen right. and you, right. you did that a little bit later so one thing you need to get a little bit more confident at is just taking that free stuff you're constantly running those diagnostic tests in the background of your mind is there free stuff did my opponent blunder any pieces um, i i tunnel visioned right that's what i did because Several moves before that, I was mm -hmm. thinking about my bishop's line of attack to exactly. his rook. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get that rook, right? And I just forgot about everything else. That's exactly what it is. But I want to point out, your move d4 is also really good. Because had he moved his rook away, mm. what, would you, what would you have done now? Now I can take the pawn that's e3 with the pawn I just pushed, which also threatens his knight Bingo. at d2. And let's practice finishing me off in this position. Let's say that he moves his knight away, for instance, to b3. Now, mm -hmm. don't be intimidated by 
all of the stuff that's going on here, you still need to apply fundamental thinking patterns. Is there anything that you could take here and ideally also prepare to checkmate him? Right. Um, okay. I'm looking for two potential moves. I'd like you to name both of them. There's two things that you can take here which constitute free stuff. Free stuff. Okay, we like free stuff. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> now you're going to see mm. it. My bishop to d5. Are you taking anything? Nope, that, that's not free at all. That's not free. That's a trade. It's literally a capture. Yeah, you could capture the queen. That's a trade. But you don't necessarily want to do that. That doesn't No, I don't want to do that. And, and I was thinking, like, I move my bishop, the one that's at... Um, b7 to uh d5 mm -hmm. and threaten the knight but that's that's a trade too because his uh, queen is covering that right so you're not um, actually threatening the knight that's that's another no. thing in your mind it might be pedantic of me to say this but like you should only reserve the word threatening for when literally you're threatening to capture a piece and you win material this yeah, is no, just it's like not a, tension. It's not a threat at all it's just a straight trade we just thin the board you exactly know, on, equal on both sides so uh there's the, his two pawn buttons. at mm -hmm. His pawn at h4 is free for sure. Bingo. Uh, with my bishop. And you said you kind of you, you you gave it away to me. You, you said the <laughs> other one is a pawn too, which is the pawn at f4. Exactly. Exactly. See, I was tunnel visioning even now. I wasn't looking at those because I'm just like, oh, those pawns are they're they're not doing anything. Like they're useless. Like he's wasted them. I'm not even gonna look at them. I want to look at his this weird back line he has and this knight that's surrounded by pawns. Like I'm looking in I'm pointing as if you can see where I'm pointing. But you know, like the this this back triangle of the board. Exactly. It's like you've you know you've you've been on some desert island subsisting on fruit <laughs> for like three weeks and you've come and, and you've come to like Golden Corral. And you're looking at the steak and the salmon. You're like, what do I, what do I even do, man? There's so much going on here. I could take his queen. Ooh, I could attack his knight. And this is a completely normal part of the process. Um, and the better you get, you just get calmer about looking at these positions. I look at this position. I don't see chaos. I see these hanging pawns, and I see the very weak king. So, let's say you capture on h4. What additional benefit does this move have? Can he, can he take your queen? <laughs> No, he's in check, so he has to exactly. do, he has to move his uh, or, or block his king, do he, something. With he that, has yeah. to move his king out, and this is where I'll introduce to. Well, I'm sure you understand and know the concept of tactics. Um, have you talked about that? I guess how much have you talked about that with Robert and the other people who've trained with the concept of chess tactics? Not very, not very much, I don't oh. think. So, tactics, um, and I'm sure you've heard that word thrown around. Essentially, the easiest way to conceptualize it is tactics is anything that aims to do one of two things. Checkmate the king or win material. Any okay. move that falls under that umbrella is a tactic. Anything that aims to accomplish that is a tactic. And okay. tactics are going to be the building blocks on which you're going to build the foundation of your chess development. <clears throat> and in this position, you're going to find your very first tactic. And I'm going to guide you to it. Okay. Do, you, do you see this queen on d1? <clears throat> what is it defended by? Uh, it's defended by the king. Bingo. And that is it. That is it. That is yep. a warning sign for white. Because hypothetically, you can envision a scenario where, by means of some sort of mousetrap, you ward the king off from its defense of the queen. And then you I capture think I the see, free queen. I think I see where we're going. Um, if I move one of my rooks to d8 and i cover that file with mm -hmm. two with two i can take his queen for free that's great thinking except you're missing one problem it's white to move <laughs> my friend so he's gonna take your queen yeah. before you take his <laughs> oh. so tactics not only do you have to make this happen but you also have to make this happen with check you have to do something where he actually cannot take your queen and instead, he has to move his king away. And there is a move that serves all these purposes. <laughs> I have to do something where he can't take my queen, uh, but, I, but I put him in check? Sorry, It's a check. Yes, for? you're looking for a check. And okay. the purpose served by this check is that... And remember, with tactics and with chess in general, it's a game of tit for tat. Sometimes you need to sacrifice a little bit to gain a lot. And that is part of the reason why this move is not occurring to you right now. Because 
in your minds, you see this square, you see that you could land a piece on that square, but not to put words in your mouth, but you're probably thinking, well, this square is covered. I can't put my piece there. But it's okay. covered by none other than the king, which is also covering the queen. So the king is set to be overloaded. Okay, would that square be d3? No. No, because the queen's covering that. Right. Mm. And you can't use uh... your own queen to ward the king. It has to be an external piece. And this is another case where you're also probably tunnel visioning this d file. You think it's something related to this d file. But yeah. it's actually not. You're using a piece that you expertly put on a particularly active square. To check him. It's a check. It's a check. Mm. I know this is tough, but I want you to find this move. This is going to be a significant okay. milestone. This is going to be your first tactic. So keep at it. Okay, so if I put the bishop, my bishop, that's currently on b7 to f3, that checks him. Um, and he's, he's got to take your bishop. And what now? Take it. Now it's my initiative. I can take the queen. The king's out of position to defend her. Bingo. So now that's a free queen. That's the. That's it. Congratulate. You just found your first tactic. Bishop f3 check. Sacrificing the bishop, forcing the king, prying the king away from the queen. Now nothing is defending the queen. Free queen. Check. And notice how many pieces you have in the attack. You're going to pick this king off in the next couple of moves. Uh, it's so frustrating that it took me so long to see <laughs> one single linear move. But this is your first uh. one of its category. And it all gets asymptotically, exponentially faster after that. So as Ugh. a second question, let's say he moves his king away. What is the simplest move here? Remember the key question. Before you do anything else, is there any free stuff that you could take? <clears throat> free stuff. Okay. I mean, I can't I can't really take those bishops up there because nope. they're covered by the rooks. Protected. So that's definitely not free. Right. But the knight at B3 is free. Is. Yes. Yep, exactly. So your priority for the next couple of games is literally going to be can you quickly and efficiently identify free stuff and can you take it that's going to be like the one and only goal i know that sounds like i'm seriously putting the training wheels on but if you can do that sort of your mission has been accomplished everything else is extra credit yeah i mean that sounds like training wheels i i need you like do i desperately need that's why so. a lot of people quit chess like well this is i want to i want action you know i want to attack i want to checkmate and they hear their coach saying you know you have to like do this lame thing where you like count the number of pieces uh, that's lame i'm doing something else but that's like a necessary step of the process so just to conclude this analysis you were actually doing <clears throat> everything right up until this moment yeah and rookie eight conceptual is a great move the only problem is it blunders the rook yeah so when you have a position like this with an open board a lot of pieces out on various squares. You just have to do that blunder check. Ask yourself, is my move a blunder? Now, you were low on time here, which is okay. Now, knowing what you know now, could you do something a little bit safer where you simply move this knight away from e3? <laughs> I move the knight away. Um... I could, yeah, I could put him... I mean, it doesn't accomplish anything, but get him out of harm's way but I, I can move him to g4 right or d5 i also like the idea of moving the, what is this called again what is this relationship here pin pin you don't want pins lying around like if you can eliminate pins you want to eliminate right. pins. not all pins right. are scary but a lot of them are so where could you put this knight to eliminate that pin simultaneously Right. Well, you, you you just helped me cheat a little bit, I think, with right. uh, D5, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Knight D5. I caught that. <laughs> <laughs> you got, yeah, I tried to slip that yeah. under the covers. But Knight D5 eliminates the pin. Wide open king. And final thing I want to do is help you kind of formulate a way. Let's say you would have played Knight D5, and your opponent would have played a random move like Bishop C6. Now, right. this is where um, you kind of have to go from... I'm completely winning, like I'm up a rook. At some point, you have to make the decision to launch the final invasion and to kind of launch the final attack. But you don't have yes. to hurry with that. And that's the key point that I want to make. 
what you want to emphasize and prioritize is just getting pieces out of harm's way. So is he threatening any piece here? Uh, yes, he's threatening my rook at uh, A8. Where could you put that rook so that it at least aims somewhere in the direction of that king, so that it's at least in the action? E8 would check the king. But you're blundering again that he can take that rook. It's the exact same. <laughs> I didn't even do the blunder check. I set check. you up, I I set you up for that. That's my I bad. Made the exact same. <laughs> no, I failed. I failed the test. Ugh. F. <clears throat> That's an F. Oh, man. Okay. But not EA, but you're close. Slightly better square. Okay. Um, and you you said that it would it would threaten the king. It's not that it would threaten the king, but one thing that you want to do with rooks. Uh, are you familiar with the concept of? Well, you're familiar with the concept of a file, right? Like this is yeah, a file. Yeah. Yeah. Rooks are best on open files. An open file, as you can probably intuit, is a file that has no pawns on it, which means the rook is right. operating uncontested. So which open file near the center can you put the rook on? With no pawns on it. That's the definition of an that open file? That is the file? definition of an open file. A, a file that okay. has, and there's gradations of that definition, but that is the pure definition of an open file. Right. Okay. So when I look at D8, like yeah. initially that file looks very crowded to me. It actually doesn't look like my rook can do much at all because I'm I've got two pieces sort of taking up space Bingo. there already. But here's the key insight. If you put the rook on C8, pawns are a lot harder to remove Pawns are a lot more immobile than a piece is. If you put yes. the rook on d8, and this is another thing you're going to get more comfortable with, is seeing stuff in the long term. This is what you pointed out to me in the beginning. You know, you feel like you're seeing two steps. You can't see how, how are these pieces going to clear themselves. But the reality is all that I have to do is move my knight away, and the queen and the rook are linked on an open file, and that is a fearsome combination. Mm. So is that sort of making sense from a general perspective? It, it is. It is. It is. It, it worries me because I, I – don't think i would have got there without you pushing me there so uh, at first it does make sense but now you will so let's say he moves his queen away somewhere um this is probably the hardest part this is going to be the hardest part of your early improvement it you know in terms of charlie you mentioned that you watched a couple of videos this is also charlie's biggest weakness and he's right at a thousand and he still struggles with this so this is going to be frustrating um and there's just no way around it the concept of actually finishing your opponent off when you're two or three moves away from checkmate. So yes, can you find any potential checking squares with your queen near his king? And use the pieces in the center, like use the knight, see which squares the knight is defending, and see mm. if you can put the queen on one of those defended squares. <clears throat> and shove yeah, his king I, back toward the corner. Yeah, immediately I, I see e3. Brilliant. Queen e3 check. He has two pots of possible moves, and both of them get checkmated with the same response. Let's say king to d1. Can you find the checkmate in one? Let's see if I can. So I guess it's as simple as the queen to f2? That's not a check, though. Right. No, it's not. It just means he can't move his king, but he doesn't have to. He's not under pressure. Right. He His king is already oh, right. immobilized, so as long as you don't... Well... It has to be a check, and it has to keep these two squares under control. And yes, this is a great application. This is a great example of anti tunnel vision, where one of the pieces that participates in this mate is a piece that you might have kind of forgotten about. It like stood. It's got to be that bishop at h four, right? Because I know he's covering e one exactly. And which piece could you put on e one? The queen. Exactly. This is checkmate, and you're right. beginning to sense that relationship between the pieces. This bishop right. is, you know, the queen is dang dangling the queen like a marionette, and the king is checkmated. So this is one of the most difficult skills. Like, you're on the cusp of checkmating, actually finding that checkmating sequence. This is where solving puzzles actually comes in. This is why you've mm -hmm. probably heard of that as a training method. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why it's so important to solve puzzles. But we'll get to that. I don't want to overwhelm you. For now, what are the key, in key insights from this game? First of all, your top priority, developing your pieces in a healthy fashion. Remember that pushing your pawns out forward should not be your top priority. You should prioritize piece placement. Um, number two, when you're developing a piece, make sure you're not blocking the development of another piece, such as the movie six. Right. Number three and number four, number five, all at the same time. Your number one priority right now, looking for free stuff, 
capturing it, and identifying the threats that your opponent is posing and defending against them. If you just do those two things, a lot of correct moves will just materialize naturally.